God. So I guess we're just gonna be getting another one of these every couple of months until we're all dead, huh? I'll be the first to tell you I started watching BreadTube because of a video essayist. This video essayist, Harris B. Guy, who first got my attention with his essay, Fallout 3 is Garbage, and Here's Why. I was, and still am, really into video essays about game design, so it was an easy click for me. From there, I scrolled back and watched what he had posted up until that point. A video about Darkest Dungeon, one about Braid, and then one about racist Star Wars fans? And then another one about something called cultural Marxism? Up to this point, all of my experience with video essays was in the realm of media crit. I had never even considered that someone was making political essays as loosely as H-Bomb's early political content could be defined as an essay. But as I kept watching his channel over the years, he started posting more and more overtly leftist and anti-conservative content. A good number of people credit H-Bomb and essayists like him with getting them into leftist politics, and it's easy to see why. H-Bomb, as well as other channels like Philosophy Tube, Sean, and Dan Olson, used media analysis as a way of getting leftist ideas in front of an audience, critiquing various shows, movies, video games, and sometimes current events through a leftist framework. This was especially useful when these channels first started gaining popularity in 2017 and 2018. This was while the diaspora of Gamergate was still trying to be relevant. Video essayists were able to debunk these chuds arguments pretty handily, and gave tons of leftists and left-leaning people ammunition to fight the misinformation being spread by people like Thunderfoot and Sargon of Akkad. Armed with these arguments, the online left began to form itself with a variety of content to consume and to bolster their arguments. From the theatrical dramatics of ContraPoints, to the dry analysis of a Sean video, to the impetuous mockery that H-Bomb would subject his video subjects to. Each creator had something unique to add to the front, each one a slightly different approach to bringing more people leftward. Why then have the creators they inspired decided to fly in the face of this political strategy when it comes to other forms of leftist media? You see, there's a subset of newer video essays whose opinion on leftist streams, especially debate streams, is less than positive. We're dealing with an issue of authorities in a realm of stigmatized knowledge. This has led to a point where there are debate streamers and the people in their online social sphere on one side, and on the other side of the bread tube schism, there are people who read books, do research, and process the information into thoughtful, considered content. However, both sides have equal claim to the title bread tube, either being creators from the original cast or having emerged from the fandom. And also, both sides have ambivalent relationships to the term, so neither claim it outright. Right. So, in lieu of better names, let me suggest Cringe Angry Bros and Cool Tube. What I am saying is stop doing debates. Just stop it. Stop doing them. They're pointless, they're useless, they reinforce bad ideals of knowledge creation. Uh, and unless you're doing them as a game in which you're very clear that their relationship to the truth is less than ideal, just stop doing them. We can think of new non-competitive, cooperative ways to create knowledge and understanding together. We don't need debates. Online debates are a pointless waste of time and rarely benefits anyone but the debaters, regardless of whether they supposedly win or lose. I already knew that debate bros were a farce in terms of their progression for the left, but that harassment and hate that you sent my friend's way radicalized me against the debate bro circuit in its entirety. With that being said, Stop watching debate content. Seriously, just stop. I was gonna add the caveat that it's okay to do if you're doing it strictly for entertainment purposes. But even then, if you're doing that, you're supporting a system that encourages individualistic domination and has repeatedly resulted in the sustained harassment of racialized creators. The prevailing argument among these criticisms is that debate is either useless or actively detrimental to the left and should be deplatformed off of the left. This is in lieu of what Sophie from Mars describes as cool tube, the part of leftist YouTube that, quote, reads books and does research because no leftist streamer has ever done research on or off stream. And people like her friend DJ Mule seem really well read on leftist theory. Kautsky. There are a few issues I have with generally anti-stream and specifically anti-debate rhetoric. This is just 
patently false. I'm not even sure video essayists believe this line when they say it, because it's literally provably false. Vosh has a massive research document pinned in his Discord and subreddit, and Demon Mama has talked at length about the extensive research she's done before talks and debates that she's done on stream. Hell, the night that I wrote this part of the script, October 6th, Vosh spent the last two and a half hours of his stream researching modern South African history to add to his research document. Look, it's undeniable that video essays take a lot of work. Before I made political content, I made a few bad video essays about gaming, and even though I wasn't even on camera and most of my video footage was B-roll of gameplay, it still took a shitload of work. I don't doubt that a ContraPoints or Philosophy Tube video with the script length and production value that goes into one takes months to produce. But to imply that streamers do no preparation before their stream is ridiculous. This disconnect reads to me like video essays being unable to identify work different from that which they put into their own videos as legitimate. Video essays require a ton of behind the scenes work. Script writing, editing, cinematography, visual aids, motion graphics, and possibly a lot more. But on the opposite side of the coin, streaming requires an arguably equal amount of work, just a different kind than the kind of work a video essayist would put into their craft. A streamer needs to entertain their audience for the entire duration of a stream with little to no breaks. Streamers refer to this as being always on and it's really not easy to do. I've tried my hand at streaming and it's really difficult to keep saying funny, insightful, or otherwise entertaining shit over the course of a four to six hour stream, even when you are playing a game to keep people entertained visually. Doing so with nothing but your thoughts, a chat to react to, and a video feed of your face is incredibly draining for most people. This isn't to mention that in debate streams specifically, the streamer will be required to keep track of their opponent's points, refute them effectively, and might be expected to provide sources for their arguments in real time. But essayists like Sophie would rather dismiss all of this work in service of patting themselves on the back for reading a couple books. This one just feels like salt because again, it's ridiculous on its face. Cis white guys who aren't expected to argue for their own existence might feel this way, but that's telling, isn't it? Solari, Noah, Mule, I earnestly want to see you tell a fresh out of the closet trans teen that the arguments they've been learning from debate streamers are useless when they've been using those same arguments to fight back against their transphobic parents. I don't actually want to see that because it would be unbelievably cruel to say that to someone's face which is why these cowards decided to say it from the safety of a YouTube video. Debate streams have taught myself and thousands of other leftists arguments and rhetorical devices that we can use to argue back against fascism, neoliberalism, and capitalism. For example, if a capitalist ever tries to tell you that their favorite economic system isn't inherently exploitative, hit them with this. So imagine you're on a plane mm -hmm. and that plane crashes on an island mm -hmm. And on that island, on a large scale average, this is actually true. After a debate, most of each debater's audience will insist that their side is the winner, but most isn't all. And to drive that point home, let me paint a picture. Imagine you're a conservative and you're also a big fan of a conservative YouTuber who is always talking a big game about how the left is too scared to debate him. After weeks or even months of seeing him tweet trying to goad the left into debating him, finally, someone responds. Some doofus with bisexual lighting and pronouns in their bio accepts your boy's challenge and they set up a debate. In the days leading up to the debate, your favorite conservative tweets a lot, constantly claiming that he's going to blow this leftist out of the water and that it's gonna be a quick one. Then the day comes. The conservative comes into the debate confident, brash, abrasive. He employs all the standard conservative rhetorical devices you're used to seeing. Euphemisms, gish galloping, ad hominems, etc. But the leftist doesn't seem phased by this. They alternate between calmly using data to back up their points and outright mocking and laughing at the conservative you came to see win. The data is one thing, you can handle a few numbers being wrong. But the laughter, that sticks with you. The laughter makes your conservative YouTuber look weak. The fact that he can't pin anything on this leftist, can't get them on any points, it makes him look unbelievably weak. After the debate, you and a few other members of the conservatives audience start thinking about how weird it was that your boy couldn't 
get a single point to stick against this leftist. And because of the YouTube algorithm picking up that you watched a stream with that leftist in it, you start getting recommended more content containing them. And as you watch more and more content containing that leftist, you watch as they dismantle more and more of the opinions that your political journey has led you to believe are true. And through this, you start realizing that the conservative politics you've based your life on are a lie. And that if you really value facts and logic the way that you say you do, the most logical thing to do is to move leftward. Essayists like Sophie and Solari and Noah will scoff at the idea of this happening to anybody. But if you'll indulge me in a clip. Are we, uh, so what do you think the odds are that we're about to hear like debates don't really bring anyone over and then I'll say chat hypers if I brought you over with debate and then every one of my chats gonna go hypers because of course debates bring people over. Obviously it's a fraud. Like this happens every time. Like they're just, they're just going off vibes, you know? Um, I feel like these people are just immersed in like leftist social spaces. So they're around other lefties who don't like me. So they're like, oh, well, I didn't get brought over. I find his debate style very off-putting. And they assume then that everyone must feel that way. This isn't quite the norm for debate audiences, but it's far from uncommon. This is one of my favorites because it's like the most cowardly reason to be anti-debate and it contradicts the last section. If people tell you this is why they don't like debates, they are telling you that they have no confidence in their arguments or straight up don't know why they believe what they believe. Not to mention, credit to Ecofish for this point, when these essays do stream, and sometimes just in their regular videos, they like to debunk conservative videos like PragerU and the Joe Rogan experience. And what is debunking a video you disagree with if not having a debate with someone who can't respond to your counterpoints? If you, a video essayist, do debunking content but scoff at the idea of doing a debate, just know that you're doing a coward's debate, one where your opponent is not allowed nuance or the ability to respond, but you are. And you're no better than, and quite honestly, not as good as, streamers that can face opposing viewpoints head on instead of through the distance of a YouTube video. This is, again, provably false, but the essayists who make this claim either explicitly or through omission do so because it's convenient for their narrative that debate streamers are all content creators with immense privilege punching down at everyone around them. This ignores the fact that there are many marginalized debate streamers, such as Shark Three or Zero, who has done many debates in the past, and Demon Mama, who made a name for herself partially off of being a debate streamer in her early days. Other marginalized streamers who do or have done debates include Heem, Merrick, and Denims. It's not that hard to find marginalized streamers if you know where to look, but video essays have decided to stick their heads in the sand on this one as well. While looking into this subject, I asked Demon Mama if I could post a survey in her Discord with a few questions about how her audience feels about streaming, both debate and non-debate based, as well as video essays. Of the people who responded to the survey, 100% of respondents said that they watched all three forms of media. 63% said that before they started watching online leftist content, they didn't consider themselves a leftist. Though 29% of that 63% said that they would have if they had the vocabulary to do so. The remaining 71% of that 63% credits at least one current or former debate streamer for them now identifying as a leftist. Except for one person who only answered Chapo. Every single respondent has at least two or three video essayists they enjoy and watch regularly. And when asked why they gravitate towards streamed content, they had a variety of answers. The results of this survey tell me that this schism between video essayists and streamers is one that is almost entirely one-sided. Every political streamer I have ever watched has recommended a video essay to me at some point. And I think this is because streamers recognize that video essays fill a rhetorical niche that they can't, allowing a creator to go on a super deep dive without having to memorize three hours worth of content to regurgitate on stream. But some video essays can't seem to accept the fact that not everyone will be convinced by an essay. I believe that video essays are really good at moving people further left if they are already left of center and somewhat agree with your original point already. This is because, and this is actually a fact, 
no conservative is going to watch your 114 minute video about why Ben Shapiro is bad actually. There are not many people who would sign up to watch a video of that length that would just tell them that all of their political beliefs are wrong and all of their political leaders are idiots. This isn't an indictment on anyone either. That's just a really hard thing for anyone to do. It's why I tried to keep my DJ Mule video pretty short and why I'm trying to keep this one well under an hour, in the hopes that the people who fight so hard against building a bigger tent at least give it a shot. I want to end this video by making it clear that I love video essays when they're done well and in good faith. I've rewatched H-Bomb's video about vaccines probably two dozen times in the year and a third that it's been live. And earlier in this video, I mentioned Ecofish, a dude who put out possibly my favorite video essay of 2022, where he goes through DJ Mule's entire Xander Hall video line by line and disintegrates every point he makes. It's fantastic. Essays are good, and there are tons of really great video essays, both from the old guard and from new talent cropping up. But some of these essayists have gotten addicted to sniffing their own farts. They can't stand the idea that someone more abrasive than them can get an audience and they want to put a stop to that. This isn't as black and white as video essayists would have you believe, where you have cringe angry bros on one side and cool tube on the other. Video essays and streams, both debate and non-debate, are useful for bringing people over to the left. And this infighting about whether or not streamers deserve to have a platform is not just pointless, it's actively detrimental to our cause. It's hard for me to find more ways of saying this, so why don't I just end with a question. Why can't we just work together?